Public. Special edition of This Is Exclusive. Shavan joins me. We are focusing on that big story for the next 24 hours, which is United States presidential poll. Shavan, it's turning out to be a cliffhanger. What do we have for our viewers for the next one hour? In fact, I can say this. Uh, perhaps, unlike in the Indian elections, we can perhaps go ahead with an exit poll when it comes to the American elections. And perhaps we will not be asked a question about whether we were right or wrong. But ladies and gentlemen, over the next one hour, we're going to take you through a special coverage uh, from the United States of America. How exactly does it really look, this election? Undoubtedly, what is being called, Abhishek, as uh, another cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. Will it be a repeat of what we saw in the previous elections? Of course, it turned out to be the worst as far as uh, the history of democracy in America is concerned. Will that really repeat? Will the candidate who's defeated, will they concede? That's the, the other big question here. So over the next couple of minutes, we're going to not only take you through the biggest newsmakers joining us from the United States of America, but also give you a mood of which way is it really swinging, because it's all about the swing states there. And if you're wondering whether you get a clear picture by the end of the day, is that the big question? The swing states are swinging widely, going by the, the opinion polls. And just 24 hours before, we get the first trends, which, is, which should be by tomorrow evening. But tonight, we are getting for you some sitting congressmen, some people from uh, across the states, particularly the swing states. Uh, so hold on. Let's begin with the headlines. <laughs> As campaigning ends, millions of Americans headed to the polls to choose between the two sharply different visions for the country. As the U.S. presidential race heats up, focus shifts to the seven swing states, closest contest in the U.S. history. Special puja and prayers at temple in Kamala Harris's ancestral village in Tamil Nadu, India. Brain's uh, main stock indexes uh, saw a modest uptick. Blue chip for 300 was up 0.3% to 8,000. 211 points. The mid cap FTSE 250 edged up 0.1 percent. In a roller coaster ride, Indian stock indices swing between red and green. Sensex finally closed the day at 79.476 points, up 694 or 0.88 percent. Ladies and gentlemen, all eyes would be on the seven swing states. And that is the reason why, if you've seen, both the contenders have largely focused their entire campaigning around these seven states. If you really look at the multiple polls that have been put out by the Western media, it's a neck-to-neck -neck race that is going on. It's a tight race to the White House. But let's begin with our first big guest joining us on this is exclusive is Sri Thanedar. Congressman from Michigan. Sri Tarada, thank you very much for speaking to Republic TV. Let me straight away begin by asking you the mood on the ground as far as Michigan is concerned, because that is going to be another crucial state. What is the sense that you are getting? Hello. So I am uh, going from polling places to polling places. Uh, Polls have now opened. 
Uh, it's been one and a half hour. We're seeing a lot of enthusiasm among young people. Uh, there is a huge gender gap. Uh, women are voting, very excited to vote for Kamala Harris. Uh, so young people are also very excited to vote for Kamala Harris. And now, recently, Trump has uh, said some derogatory things about women, about uh, Puerto Ricans, about Hispanics. So Trump has turned off a lot of people. And uh, we are starting to see that um, that people uh, are uh, uh, wanting to support Kamala Harris. And I'm starting to see a momentum gaining for Kamala Harris here in Michigan. Sri, talking about the Indian American community, traditionally they have uh, voted Democrat. And uh, you come from the Democrat Party. But increasingly we have seen traction building up even in support of Republicans generally. but. Trump specifically, you think that there is going to be some fracture seen in the Indian American vote this time around? The, uh, look, the Indian American vote is not monolithic. We have uh, support among Indian Americans. Uh, they are liberals, they are moderates, they are conservatives. <coughs> some are supporting Trump uh, because they feel that uh, Trump uh, is better for economy. Uh, but it's not really true. Uh, under a Republican administration, the economy has not done as well. The stock market has not done as well as uh, it has done under the Democratic uh, leadership. Uh, the, currently, the U.S. stock market is all-time high under the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, so, uh, so there is support among both. Uh, but it is some people perceive Kamala Harris would be better for India. Uh, others perceive Trump would be better. In my own opinion, uh, the tariffs that Trump is going to bring. Uh, is going to impact uh, pricing, and it will not be good. Those tariffs will not be good for consumers. And so uh, Kamala Harris would be a lot better for stronger U.S.-India relationships. Right. Congressman Thanedar, what we saw just about a few days ago on the eve of Diwali, when you've had former President uh, Trump making the statement about Bangladesh and about protecting the Hindu rights, bringing in the spotlight on Hindu phobia. Many would contrast that with the squeamish response that we have largely seen with Vice President Kamala Harris. Do you believe that is something that may not have really gone down well with the Indo-Americans, particularly not taking a position on matters like these? Well, look, uh, Trump uh, has appealed uh, to the Hindus, but we have to remember that uh, Trump is more anti-immigrants than anybody else. Uh, Trump is uh, uh, supported the white supremacists uh, who have, uh, you know, hated, has a lot of hatred towards immigrants. Um, under Trump, uh, minorities uh, were discriminated. Uh, so uh, this election time appeal uh, to the Hindus uh, for political reason People can see through that, that uh, Trump is not sincere. Uh, Trump has always supported the white supremacist. Trump has always been uh, shown a racism attitude towards the minorities. And just this last minute election eve appeal isn't going to change many Indian American minds. It's not going to change many Hindu minds. Congressman Tanita, thank you very much for joining us on Republic TV. We are hoping to get you back in a few hours from now, as perhaps many would say some trends may actually trickle out. All the best, uh, Congressman Tanida. We'll see you in a short while from now. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Sri Tanida, the congressman there. And uh, Rick Mehta joins us uh, live. He's a Republican. And uh, Rick... Uh, how is it looking like? Uh, I was uh, asking Sri Thanedar about whether the Indian American community is going to swing a bit towards Trump this time. Are you seeing that on the ground? We're seeing that big time. I think the, the good congressman lives in an echo chamber and he lives in a bubble. Uh, what he said about uh, President Trump is a blatant lie. Um, and I'll tell you the reason is because uh, President Trump has been one of the only candidates that has condemned the violence against religious, uh, including Hindus in Bangladesh. Uh, Kamala Harris has been largely silent. And so when you look at the voting blocks of Indian Americans, especially in the swing states, they're the ones that are looking for a candidate who's going to save our economy. 
the congressman can talk about, you know, a, a booming uh, stock market. But does that really matter when you're at uh, depression level uh, unemployment rates? You know, if people can't find a job, if interest rates are high, if the cost of goods has increased more than 20 to 30 percent and people can't afford gas, milk, eggs and your basic necessities, uh, then what good is any of these uh, rhetoric talking points saying Kamala Harris is going to save us? Well, she's in office right now. And the major question people have is how come she's not using her power and influence to save the economy? It's all talking points. We've seen it time and time again. But when President Trump won in 2016, in 2017, we had the most thriving economy and the relationship between U.S. and India was never stronger. And so I think Indian Americans, especially in the swing states, are silently what we call the silent majority are, are shifting towards President Trump because they know he's good for small businesses. He, know, he knows that the economy is going to be booming. Listen, Indian Americans have the, one of the largest GDPs out of any uh, racial groups in America. And so the economy is something that's extremely important. All these feel-good talking points, the social issues, uh, of course we care about them, but is that really going to carry the day when the economy is so bad right now? Um, and it's not. And so the congressman, I hope he pulls himself out of that echo chamber that he lives in and sees what the entire rest of the country is experiencing right now. Congressman Rick Mehta, if I can also take this question with, to you. When President Biden took office, many thought that uh, the policies that were largely introduced uh, by President Trump would have been dropped. That wasn't really the case. There was a continuity that we saw. If at all President Trump comes back, do we see a continuity on key issues, particularly with regards to immigration? Because that's another thing that would hit the Indians too. Because in the past, it hasn't really gone down well during President Trump's time. Well, the country has a really bad immigration problem altogether, and not just immigration legally, but illegal immigration. Um, and it's you can't fix you know a broken system until you start to fix the illegal parts of it. Um, and so President Trump has time and time again said that and and reflected on that and and executed on that, where we said we have to stop the illegal immigration crossings in order to make it fair for our legal immigration system to recruit and bring in the best and the brightest from all across the world, not just from one uh, geographical location. And so I think you're going to see a much more streamlined and improved immigration process. The relationships between Trump and Modi has been extremely good. Um, and at the end of the day, President Trump is a deal maker. He will use that as a tool to negotiate better outcomes for Americans. He will use, whether it's tariffs or other, or other tools in his tool uh, belt, in order to use that as leverage to allow for better relationships with countries. And so I think you're going to see a much significantly more improved uh, immigration system and a big benefit for India and Indian Americans that are looking to immigrate to the U.S. Well, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Rick Mehta, for joining us. Uh, we are hoping to get you back because right now we're just getting the sense of what's really happening on the ground. Things are going to really change in the next uh, couple of hours. And here on Republic TV, this is a continuous coverage over the next few hours. Thank you very much, Congressman, for joining us uh, on the broadcast. So we, we get you a sense of uh, what the Democrats essentially mean for the Indians as well as, uh, for that matter, the Republicans. Now, the campaigning is over. It has been vitriolic if you really see the kind of campaigning that has taken place. The last uh, campaigning that has been done by the former President uh, Trump, uh, where he's essentially hitting out at Kamala Harris. Many would say that, uh, you know, that's been the key messaging that President Trump has done. As far as Kamala Harris is concerned, remember, largely looking at uh, the diaspora too and how exactly the Indian diaspora really responds, all of that put together. The campaigning that ended a short while back. Let's take you through the key factors in the campaigning that got over. Donald Trump seeks to make a rare comeback. His campaign slogans, Make America Great Again, and I Am Your Voice, have reiterated his America First policy. This is really the end of a journey, but a new one will be starting, and that's the one we've wanted to partake in, which is basically to make America great again. And now we'll have a chance to do it after today. Hopefully, 
Everything will work out well. We're way leading. All we have to do is close it out. We have to close it out. He was officially nominated on July 15, 2024 at the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee when he also announced J.D. Vance as the nominee for vice president. The next vice president of the United States, the current senator from Ohio, J.D. Vance and his incredible wife, Usha. From focusing on key issues like expansion of executive and presidential power to promising stronger economic policies to the abortion ban, Trump makes a host of promises. Trump's campaign has been marred by controversies, including allegations of white supremacist and anti-Semitic statements, as well as concerns over authoritarian and anti-democratic rhetoric. If Trump loses, he has refused to accept the results just as he did four years ago when he lost to Democratic President Joe Biden. The only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. It's the only way we're going to lose this election. So we have to be very careful. Now look, we have, this is more than this election. That's a big statement. If Trump refused to accept a victory by Democratic rival Kamala Harris, this could throw the U.S. into political instability at a time when the country is already deeply divided. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has vowed to investigate or prosecute political rivals, election workers and left-wing Americans if he becomes president again. All right, uh, we have more guests uh, joining us uh, from across uh, the United States. Uh, we have Trey King. He's uh, mayor of uh, uh, Dakula in Georgia. He's uh, a Republican. And uh, uh, very good evening to you from here. And uh, we also have uh, Professor Latham joining us uh, live. Uh, Andrew Latham, he's joining us live from Canada. And uh, we have Dheeraj Kaul. He's a geopolitical analyst uh, joining us uh, live uh, and uh, I, I would want to begin with Trey King. Uh, Mr. King, uh, there was, uh, you're in Georgia, one of the swing states. How is it looking like there for Trump? And uh, there was uh, a verdict earlier in the day, I believe, uh, by the Georgia Supreme Court, which uh, said that all the ballots can be taken in only till 7 p.m. or the last time that's available till tomorrow. Uh, how's that going to impact uh, the chances for Trump in Georgia? Well, I can only speak specifically for our community. We're, we are a community of about 8,000 in a county of about 1 million people. Um, the county itself is pretty diverse. I would consider it probably a purple county, um, probably equally divided between Republicans and Democrats. But I think probably the reality of where people are economically is going to push things toward Trump. Um, we have people in our community. I can give you an example, like my own daughter-in-law has been out of work for four months and she's been actively seeking work and she has the skill. She's a bookkeeper. Um, she does account, accounts receivable, accounts payable, and she is a Latino background. So just to think that somebody could actively be working in what is Biden considers to be this great economy and you can't find work and you have a marketable skill set is kind of unheard of. Um, also, we have in our community, we have a, a large number of blue collar workers, and I think the blue collar workers are probably feeling the pinch the most, um, you know, working. My son is one, for an example. He works 60 or 70 hours a week um, just to pay the bills, and it is getting really, really tough. The price of gas is up. The price of groceries is astronomical compared to what it was just a couple years ago, and I think that's going to be a bigger factor than some of the political talking points that we hear coming down from the national level. I think just the reality of where people are economically is really hitting home now. It's taken a little bit of time, I believe, but I think our community overall will swing toward the Republican side. Uh, and you're saying that that's happening because of the economic factors and uh, maybe in the four years of Trump, the economy was better and it's not been that great in the present Biden-Harris administration. And that's the reason why it could swing Republican. You say it's a purple county, a purple, yeah. purple uh, community. 
Yeah, exactly. I think that's going to push it in that direction. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, I'm 60 plus years old. I have a lot of friends that are of that same age group. And, you know, within a year after Biden took office, some of us lost 25 or 30 percent of our what we had saved in our 401k. And it's only gradually come back over the last six months to a year to what it almost was before he took office. And I think that's another factor with older folks, not just the younger people in their 30s and 40s. Mr. King, just a, one quick question before I let you go. Everyone sure. remembers uh, what really happened in the last elections when President Trump uh, refused to accept uh, the decision, the mandate of the people of America. Why exactly are we really staring at this deeply divided, polarized country right now? What has really changed on the ground? Um. What had changed under Trump specifically? In terms um, of the division that we see. Um, I think some of the division has just been driven by what people have as far as there's a growing distrust of government, I think, in the community. Um, I think people are more reluctant to accept government mandates, particularly after what happened during COVID. A lot of people don't feel like in our community that was handled effectively. Um, I think that on top of some questionable election results that may have come out um, where people were not really sure that their vote counted, at least in their feelings, you know. Um, and I think that has just kind of fueled a little bit of a distrust. And I think that has contributed to that division where they're not necessarily willing to accept things offhand of what the government says. Um, I'm just saying that generally, I mean, being in being in local government and everything, as I am in a smaller community, I mean, everything that we do is completely transparent. But on the national level, I don't people I don't think people have that same feeling of trust. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tricking, for joining us on this uh, broadcast. I'll also request um, all our guests who are joining us uh, to stay on with us as we take you through what's really happening in the Democrat camp. What is it that Kamala Harris really stands for? Ladies and gentlemen, over the last few months, uh, the introduction of Vice President Kamala Harris as the presidential candidate in itself, remember, came through as a surprise, given the fact that uh, Joe Biden for a very long time was insisting that he would be the presidential candidate. But remember, questions were raised about his failing health and Kamala Harris, without even going for the primaries, became the candidate as far as the Democrats are concerned. What is it that Kamala Harris really has to offer? A recap of all that she has said in the run-up to the elections. As the most turbulent US presidential elections enter its final hours, it is a neck-to-neck -neck battle between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. Bitter rivals Trump and Harris are separated by the narrowest margins in polls, which shows this election is a flip of coin. The seven swing states will decide the fate of America, with Harris focusing on Michigan, Trump targeting on Georgia, North Carolina and Pennsylvania. Kamala Harris became the nominee for presidential elections relatively later, after Biden stepped down from the US presidential race. Then she selected Tim Walz as her running mate. Later, released a detailed policy guideline in September to make US citizens understand what Harris Walz administration would look like. Let's look at some of the key promises made by her. Some of the key promises of Harris to America offers wide range of ideas aimed at making life more affordable to citizens of America. Many of Harris's proposals are similar to Biden's administration. She advocates restoring nationwide abortion rights. While she continues to support cross-party border security bill, she also promises to expand publicly funded health care. As the candidates make a final push ahead of the D-Day, Harris, after a series of encouraging rallies, have said, We have momentum. It's on our side. In one of the most consequential elections of our lifetime, and we have momentum, it is on our side. Can you feel it? And we have 
the momentum because our campaign is tapping into the ambitions, the aspirations, and the dreams of the American people. Because we are optimistic and excited about what we can do together. During the final leg of her election campaign, Harris has expressed her confidence that she would win the race for White House. Because here's what everyone here knows. When you know what you stand for, you know what to fight for. And we have an opportunity in this election to finally turn the page on a decade of politics driven by fear and division. We are done with that. And we are exhausted with it. Meanwhile, Harris received support from celebrities like Taylor Swift, Jennifer Lopez and Beyonce. As we near to the D-Day, it will be interesting to see who wins, reaches the 270th finish line. Alright, uh, let's uh, go to Dheeraj now and uh, Dheeraj, how is it looking like? Uh, uh, even the Swiss states showing that it's really neck and neck. There is no particular lead. Uh, but still, you think that uh, the national popular vote might go Trump's way, finally? Hello, thank you for having me on the show. Um, I think uh, it's one of the closest uh, elections I have seen. And to be honest, uh, this is the closest a female uh, candidate has come to a presidency election. But if you look at the swing state, I'm currently in Pennsylvania, which happens, it looks like whoever wins Pennsylvania will end up in White House. So Pennsylvania is, is, is currently a tie based on the data which is currently coming hourly. But out of the seven swing states, I think four are leaning towards Trump, which is Nevada, North Carolina, uh, Georgia. But Wisconsin and Michigan is, uh, is, is leaning towards Harris and Arizona is already very clear towards Trump. So if you look at numbers, it looks like Trump's, uh, uh, you know, campaign has really gained momentum within last uh, eight weeks. Now, I'm very connected with the ground. I'm a physician and I have a lot of uh, friends and communities, Indian and other people. And I will tell you one thing. There are few things on which Trump is striking a chord with people and millennials and Gen Z and people of my generation, like I'm an entrepreneur too. So things like immigration, that's a very, very important factor. When I say immigration, I don't mean legal immigration. I'm, I'm talking about illegal immigration. Around 12 million people have come. And even in Pennsylvania, places like Scranton, where Joe Biden is from, the crime rate has gone up. There are people on the streets. Uh, uh, it's never heard of people beating up cops, stealing money from there, live in Times Square. We have seen those pictures. Uh, murder rapes are happening. So people are feeling very insecure right now. The second issue is, uh, and, and, and to be honest, the people with legal immigration, which is one of the largest population for that is India and China and Indian techno technicians and Indian people with IT background, they have to wait 15 to 20 years because of backlog. So immigration based on talent and close relatives is what Trump supports. So I, I, I think for educated class, uh, his policy is going to be very good for immigration. The second is economy. Inflation is very high, like somebody mentioned. Uh, eggs are $5, $6 or $5 for bread. That's hurting common man. Interest rates are high, so I'm connected uh, with biotech sector in finance of healthcare. So the if you look at the micro cap companies and, uh, and mid cap, they have been crushed. The only growth in stock market you are seeing for last six months, the biggest is in macro cap and Magnificent, Magnificent Seven. They have sucked up the oxygen. So that's not a real indicator of how stock market is moving. If you look at employment, Employment is low. And when I talk about employment, I'm, I mean quality employment, not a person who has worked for a week in Dunkin' Donut or McDonald. You don't, that's that. Well, Dheeraj Kohl, I just request you to stay on with us because, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, questions that are essentially being asked as to when do we really get to know that uh, who exactly is going to be the 47th president of United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, in terms of how it was all designed, if you really look at the elections that have taken place in the United States of America, the focus has largely been on keeping democracy intact. 
And that is the reason why those who drafted the entire constitution and the very fact the way the elections are going to take place was to keep in mind that democracy is at the heart of it. But keeping that, remember, the focus is on the electors and the fact that you have a mark of 270 to reach. How exactly does that happen? How long does that procedure essentially take place? And how many electors in each of these states would really decide the fate of each of these candidates? Take a look at this explained. With the fate of America all set to be decided on the big Harris versus Trump battle in the 2024 US polls, let's first try and understand the poll process and how the electoral college works. There are 538 electors across the country. A candidate needs to 70 of those electoral votes to win the presidency. Each state's number of electors equals its total congressional representation, the number of House members plus two senators. But what is Electoral College? Well, Electoral College is a system used to elect the US president and vice president. There are 538 electors. A candidate needs to 70 votes to win. The process was created by the US Constitution as a compromise between direct voting and congressional selection. Let's move on to understand how electors are chosen. Each state gets electors based on its number of congressional representatives, House plus two senators. Political parties nominate electors who pledge to vote for their candidate if that candidate wins the state's popular vote. Now, what happens on election day? Voters are technically voting for electors and not directly for the president. Most states use a winner-takes-all rule. Whoever gets the most votes in a state wins all the state's electoral votes except for Maine and Nebraska, who use a proportional method splitting votes based on the results. But most importantly, what are swing states? These states are up for grabs and can vote for either party. They often decide the election. Swing states change each election cycle, but key examples include Florida, Pennsylvania and Michigan. Let's now understand what happens after election day. Well, states certify the results and send the list of electors to the National Archives. In December, electors meet in each state to cast their votes for president and vice president. Those votes are sent to Congress for counting. And finally, how does Congress count the votes? On the 6th of January, a joint session of Congress that counts the electoral votes. The vice president presides over this session, announces the results and declares the winner if they've reached 270 electoral votes. On Inauguration Day, the new president is sworn in on the 20th of January and officially takes office. All right, uh, let's uh, get in Andrew Latham uh, into this conversation. Andrew, Professor Latham, um, you know, uh, was that a Canadian prime minister or a leader who said once that uh, so far from God, so near to America, how's the view like for you from the other side of the Great Lakes? Well, I'm from the other side of the Great Lakes, but I'm an immigrant to the United States as well, so I'm here now. Um, things are looking, as some of your previous uh, guests have said, it's indecipherably close. We can't know how this is going to turn out. If I were a betting man, and I'm not, I would say that the Republicans will carry the Senate. I'm pretty sure they'll carry the House. But when it comes to the presidency, I'm not quite sure. In terms of the implications for the country um, above us, as Canadians like to refer to themselves, um, it, a Trump administration, ironically, would be better for Canada than a Harris administration. The Harris administration would really, uh, it, it's far more, and people don't realize this, it's far more, it would be far more protectionist than a Trump administration. And that, of course, would hurt the Canadian automobile industry. It would have all kinds of implications for Canadian uh, uh, trade and beyond that, security as well. Um, if I were still living in Canada and my parents are there, my sister's there, I've got lots of family there, I would be very concerned about the outcome of this election. And ironically, even though most Canadians don't like Donald Trump, um, a Trump administration would be better for Canada than a Harris administration. Well, Arun, if I can just uh, bring you in also right now with regards to, you know, 
as far as what really does India have to get from this? Now, for both sides, uh, even with uh, President uh, Biden, what we have essentially seen that the relationship with India has only strengthened over a period of time. How do you think that each of these candidates uh, would really work out a relationship with India? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, hope you guys can hear me. As a political strategist and analyst, I'm not going to take any sides. Um, I'll try to be uh, <laughs> nonpartisan here. So if you look at, just speaking based, uh, totally factual based, if you look at the past 20 years, right, or 24 years, the Republican administration, I think, has been favorable uh, when it comes to India, uh, be it the 2005, the landmark uh, civic nuclear deal, when Mr. Manmohan Singh was the prime minister, uh, George W. Bush was the uh, president at the time in 2005, in the second term, or the a host of agreements India signed in around 2016, 2017, 2019, be it the uh, GSO MIA or LAMOA, uh, Comcasa, Becca. So all these agreements were signed uh, between 2016, I believe 2018 or 2020. So we're looking purely uh, based on uh, facts. I think the Republican administration, again, proved to be fair, uh, you know, favorable to the, to the Indian uh, administration. That's not to say, uh, again, Trump, uh, Donald Trump is different. Now, Donald, I, I tell people Donald Trump is, is two people, one, one a Republican, and Trump himself. Uh, he, he is slightly unpredictable uh, because he is against, uh, uh, nature-wise, he's against uh, multilateral institutions, uh, he's against NATO, uh, NAFTA, and, and, and other alliances in general. So uh, he's also against uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, IP uh, Economic Framework, IPEF, which is a pretty pretty important for India. It's actually important for U.S. too. Uh, if U.S. wants to contain China, it has to invest in IPF. But that's a different story. But yes, I think uh, the, the Republican administration has been, uh, you know, favorable, historically speaking. Also, uh, be, be it pol political rhetoric or, or, or anything else, he, uh, Trump constantly claims uh, Mr. Modi is his friend. So obviously, uh, Trump is, 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 is being very, uh, not just forthright, but he has a foresight uh, into establishing, should he win, into establishing a friendly relation, or I should say continuing the existing friendly relationships he has with Mr. Modi and his administration. So yeah, I think uh, uh, he, he would be favorable. When it comes to Kamala Harris, she never made any statements against India. Uh, well, she, she claims herself, uh, she always, I, I don't think she explicitly claimed her Indian heritage as openly as she did claim her black heritage. But putting that aside, uh, I don't think she made any strong uh, statements in favor of India, at least not as yet. Uh, Trump went overboard the other day when he spoke in favor of Hindus. Uh, again, that's not to say Hindus represent entire India, but still a significant chunk of the population is Hindus. So he is trying to woo the voter base. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I think, I personally think Trump, given his unpredictability, uh, I still think Trump would be, uh, or Trump's administration would be favorable. You, even if you look at historically, uh, even from independence uh, during Truman times, when Harry Truman was the president of the United States from 1944 to 1952, from then onwards, US, uh, India always had a blow hard, blow cold kind of relationship. And actually, it was very sour. Uh, US uh, you know, uh, imposed sanctions on India after the 1996-1998 tests in Pokhran. Uh, but the, it's only start, I should say, beginning of the century, which is literally 2000, uh, when George W. Bush became the president. That is when the uh, relationships with India, or I should say U.S.-India uh, relations, started becoming better. Uh, and, you know, there was rapprochement after that. So ever since uh, the relationship only got better and better. So, yeah, given all that history, I personally think, uh, Trump or Republican administration in general uh, would be favorable uh, when it comes to India. Again, not to mention Donald Trump uh, kind of pressured India, uh, you know, in, into not buying oil from Iran 
uh, a couple of years ago. But again, uh, uh, due to relations with, uh, with with the U.S., India was able to overcome or surpass those. Um, I have to. Um, I have to uh, uh, sanctions, but even, even for Middle East, I think it's it's still better. If, if, uh, Trump yeah, administration. Arun, uh, absolutely. The rapprochement you were talking about has been bipartisan. In fact. Uh, uh, irrespective of uh, whether it's been a Democrat administration or Republican, uh, or the Capitol Hill and the White House, um, India-U.S. partnership has been uh, gaining strength from strength. Of course, there have been occasional headwinds. Uh, uh, typically, we have seen that when there is a Democrat administration and president in the White House, uh, you typically see some push and shove happening on the issues of religious freedom, etc., while if you have a Republican president, there would be some push and shove on the issue of trade. Let's look at how the Trump and Kamala Harris presidencies could pan out uh, insofar as India-U.S. relationship goes. The Trump versus Harris debate has echoed in India as well. The question that has now entered the fray which candidate is better for the Indian foreign policy? Shalab Kumar, Trump's closest they see it, alleges that Harris has problematic views on Kashmir. He also says that Trump's position on Hindus is crystal clear. Uh, Kamala has radical views on Kashmir. And uh, India will have to be um, conscious. But that doesn't matter okay. now. Because well, this is abolished. It, 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 because they will still raise the issue of uh, so-called minorities, so-called Muslim minorities. So every time Joe Biden gets a chance, every time Kamala gets a chance, Kamala will be even more enhanced. Oh, uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, BJP in India is is persecuting minorities. Forget about what's happened in Bangladesh. Forget about what's happening everywhere else. Forget about what's happening in Canada uh, against Hindus. So uh, they, to them, Hindus are the majority and uh, uh, the radical Islam. I'm not just going to say Muslims, but radical Islam is a uh, minority. Kamala Harris, the daughter of an Indian-born mother and a Jamaican-born father, has talked about her Indian heritage on several occasions. Under Biden and Harris, the United States formed several key strategic agreements, including bolstering the Quad Alliance against Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific region. The United States government also finalized several crucial defense and technology deals including the recent deal for the sale of predator drones. Her opponent Donald Trump, on the other hand, has talked about his good rapport with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. When India, which is a very big abuser, uh, he happens to be coming to meet me next week. And Modi, he's a fantastic, I mean, fantastic man. Uh, these, a lot of these leaders are fantastic. You have to understand one thing. They're dealing, they're 100% these people are the sharpest people. They're not a little bit backward. They're not, they are at the top. You know the expression, they're at the top of their game. Both the leaders have their respective foreign policy stances with regard to India. Who's better for us? That's something only time will tell. All right. Uh, time to thank our guests who have joined in the rich call, Arun Ayagiri and uh, Professor Andrew Latham. And uh, Shavan continues to be with us. Uh, we, in fact, have uh, some more stories lined up on the U.S. ports. Well, in fact, we'll slip into a short break um, and then 